Good afternoon and welcome to our CRESS webinar for May 2021. The title of this webinar is Using Therapy and or Counseling to Stay in or Get Back in Our Right Minds, Countering Mental Health Stigma in the Black Community. My name is Sarisi West Olatunji and I am co-founder of Cress Achieve. And I am co-founder with Dr. Constance West. Cress Achieve is a culture-centered trauma-informed care training program that seeks to counter race-based trauma and continuous traumatic stress in order to transform black children's home and school environments to promote academic excellence and socio-emotional well-being. Uh, we've presented several workshops. Uh, we've been doing them every month lately. Uh, so some of you may already know who I am. I'm a faculty member at Xavier University and director of the Center for Traumatic Stress Research there. Dr. Constance West is a licensed clinical psychologist with over 20 years of professional experience specializing in uh, juvenile forensic psychology and health clinical psychology. We have two awesome uh, members of our staff. We have Ashley uh, Levesque and uh, Janae Bond. Ashley is a third year doctoral student in the counselor education and practice program at the uh, at Georgia University, Georgia State University here in Atlanta. Um, she has a very interesting academic and professional interests. They include multiculturalism and social justice, African-American women counseling couples and families, generational trauma and healing, as well as group work. She is a current National Board for Certified Counselors, Doctoral Minority Fellow, Akai Sigma Iota Leadership Intern, uh, Southern Association for Counselor Education and Supervision Emerging Leader, and serves as an editorial assistant for the Journal of Counselor Leadership and Advocacy. Um, Ash has done a great job of being a graduate assistant here with CRESS, and she will be, she's been involved in uh, doing a lot uh, across a number of different areas, everything from helping to develop promotional materials, managing our, web, our, CRE, our CRESS website. Hopefully you all have had a chance to visit it. Um, she has been engaged in uh, various aspects from research to coordinating webinars, such as this one in chats and disseminating the CRESS uh, newsletter and our communique. We also have Janae. Can we go back a slide? Okay, Janae Bond has been a social media intern with us. She is from Toronto, Canada. She's always had a passion for the arts and, and the area of communications. She's actually a senior um, at Xavier University and um, in mass communication. She has an excellent sense of creativity and originality. She has started her own business, so she's an entrepreneur. Um, her business is entitled Graphics by Janae. And her goal is to supply current and future clients with high quality graphics that suit their brand's image, along with excellent customer service. And now to introduce our esteemed panelists. Uh, the first panelist I'd like to introduce to you is Dr. Kent Butler. Dr. Butler serves as a professor and interim chief equity, inclusion, and diversity officer at the University of Central Florida, or UCF. Previously, he's worked at other uh, universities, such as the University of Central Florida, the College of William and Mary, at the University of Missouri at St. Louis, and the University of Connecticut. His focus in terms of his research has been to effectively enrich the lives of all people through the preparation of high qual highly qualified, culturally competent, helping professionals. He is a national certified counselor and a national certified school counselor. Dr. Butler is also president elect of the American Counseling Association, also known as ACA, and will begin serving as ACA's president in a little over six weeks on, Jan on July 1st. As an ACA fellow, he's been a member of the Association for Cultural, Multicultural Counseling and Development, also known as AMCD. 
Multicultural and Social Justice Counseling Competencies Committee, and a founder and co-chairperson of the AMCD Writers Consortium. He's a past president of AMCD and has served under a number of different ACA governing uh, 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 councils. He um, has been a member, a long-term member of ACA and a lot of other professional organizations you can see. Dr. Butler earned his PhD in educational psychology or counseling psychology and counselor education. He also has a master's in counseling psychology and school counseling and a BA in communication sciences at the University of Connecticut. We're very pleased to have him. And we welcome Dr. Tanya Marie Tinsley. Uh, she is a graduate of Duquesne University in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, she has a PhD in counselor education and supervision. She also has a doctor of ministry with a focus on prophetic congressional development using 21st century methods. Uh, she's served at, in several academic positions at the University, uh, California University of Pennsylvania, Waynesburg University, Villanova University, and uh, Mission Uni uh, Seminary seminary in Philadelphia, PA. In addition to providing academic and administrative services, Dr. Tinsley is the owner of Transitions Counseling Service and Life Skills Program that includes a ministry division, love and basketball ministries, where she provides individual marriage, family, group counseling, and consultative services. Additionally, Dr. Tinsley is the clinical director of the Mount Ararat Baptist Church Counseling Center in Pittsburgh, PA. Dr. Wessel, I think you're muted. Oh, you okay. That, that just did it by itself. Sorry. Dr. Venus Evans Winters is a former professor of education at Illinois State University in the College of, it, of Education with faculty affiliation in Women and Gender Studies, African-American Studies, and Ethnic Studies. She's also the founder of Planet Venus and creator of the Write Like a Scholar program. Dr. Evans Winters researches and teaches in the areas of social and cultural foundations of education, Black feminist thought, critical race theory, educational policy, and qualitative inquiry. With years of experience as a psychotherapist and a certified clinical trauma professional, Dr. Evans Winters embraces resilience building practices throughout her work. She is also a licensed school social worker and youth advocate with experience serving in South Africa and West Africa and participating in critical pedagogy, Paolo Freire institutes across Europe, including Malta, Greece, and Spain. Uh, before we move on to the updates, I did want to ask some of our participants uh, to just give us a shout out so we can find out where are they hailing from. So if you could in the chat, just give us a quick hello from wherever you are. So we want to see. I already see Puerto Rico uh, is definitely representing. I love it. Um, but let's see where else you are. Minneapolis. Uh, Boston, I see that. Uh, yes, Beaumont, Texas, South Florida, Montreal, I love it. Michigan, so I love that. And of course, New Orleans always has to represent. I see Virginia, absolutely. So thank you so much for joining us uh, from all over. Keep it going, I wanna see who's here. Uh, let's give you a quick update on what's going on. So if you've been checking out the website, the website, uh, we keep updating with more information. Uh, and so we want to tell you about that. We have uh, more concept papers uh, that are being uploaded. I'm going to upload another one this week. Uh, we have one from Dr. Melanie Acosta from uh, Florida Atlantic University. And uh, we will have another one. We asked another scholar, we commissioned him to develop a paper for us. So we are cranking out information uh, that will be useful to you. And we also have videos uh, available where we're interviewing these scholars so they can elaborate on 
you know, what their point of view is, what the research is all about. We have some podcasts also uh, to be able to help you. So we have those. We will have some fact sheets up because we want to give you some grab and go. So we don't always have time. I know we're all about the business. And so we don't always have time to read through uh, a paper. Uh, so we have some fact sheets that we have for you that you can just download uh, and read on the slide and keep going. Of course, the March Uplift newsletter is there and please be on the lookout. Next month, June, we'll have another newsletter that will be developed by Ashley. So look for that. Of course, Culture Centered Mondays that we started back in November, that's still up. So if you wanted to get that training, it's still available to you. And we're gonna announce a new training that's going to uh, come out. It'll be live in July and then it'll go up. So it'll be asynchronous and available to you. Uh, so also one other thing, uh, or two other things. Last month's webinar that I told you was a smashing success uh, with the, the panelists that we had last month. Uh, that webinar is, the recording of that webinar is available on our Crest YouTube channel. It's also available on our website. And again, let me tell you, it was the most uh, engaging, enlightening, and enjoyable session that we have offered to date. So you don't want to miss that. If you want to get rejuvenated, watch that video. I know you'll feel a lot better. Also, Dr. West, as you know, uh, has background and expertise in uh, juvenile forensic counseling uh, and psychotherapy, and she provided us with a video and it's free. It's available on our website and it's also on our Crest YouTube channel. So those are some of the updates of what we have available. So without further ado, we're gonna jump right into it uh, with our uh, team here, our panelists. And uh, it is my honor to start them off with the first question. So first of all, Let's just ask this straight up question. Do black people, that's children, adolescents, adults, our elders, do they need and benefit from receiving mental health services? What do you think? Anybody? I would say definitely. We all have mental health um, and uh, everybody, uh, regardless of race, ethnicity, um, it, uh, other cultural factors. Um, mental health, uh, I really like the definition that the National Institute of Mental Health says it's a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. And there's evidence that positive mental health um, can increase, help, improve health outcomes. And so I truly believe that all Black people can uh, benefit from mental health services and focusing on the domains of wellness, mind, body, and spirit. I agree, Dr. Uh, Wes Alatunji. Um, I, actually, as you all were reading Dr. Kent Butler's <laughs> bio, I was thinking that he had in his bio high quality. I do think that people of African ancestry, African people, we need access to high quality mental health services. In the same way that in the last, what, uh, 50 years, we've been bringing attention to decolonizing the healthcare industry overall, especially for black people. We need high quality access to mental health services in the same way that we need access to health services in general. So we need to bring more awareness in the same way we do to dental health care, breast health, prostate health, vaginal health, and even skin care health. We need access to high quality providers to provide services and education on overall mental health and wellness. I would echo the same. It's really important for us to recognize that the stigmas that have been attached to especially black mental health has been one that we had to deal with over time. And so we really need to get into another sphere. We need to let people know that it is okay. It's okay to seek help and support. And that is not a, a, a thing that's going to stigmatize you or make you look 
a week or anything along those lines. And so it becomes really, really important for us to not only bring people to the table, but showcase in our community why it's important. So we need to be out there and advocating for what we do and what we're supposed to be about so that all individuals know that it's going to be okay for me to step into this place right here and take care of myself. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that's a nice little warm up. Let me let me get you to this one. So we have experienced a lot in the past year and a half just about since last March, uh, where we have been seeing a lot of visualizations of our oppression. So how has the COVID-19 pandemic and these, these visual representations of police brutality affected Black people, particularly youth, uh, and our need for mental health services? Anyone? I'll, I'll start off. Um... I'll let you know that uh, this past year has been really rough. It's been tough. And I, I specifically chose not to watch the, uh, a video, a certain video that we now know is nine minutes and 29 seconds long. I watched it once. I did not allow myself to ever watch it again in protection of myself. But I will tell you that every time I leave my house, I know that I'm a black man and I know that I'm at risk. And it's a constant, you know, I've been talking as of late about continuous traumatic stress disorder and what that's like and what driving down the street is like and seeing a police officer off to the side of the road, even seeing a police officer off to the side of the road has really kind of enlightened me and, and, and kind of does something visceral to me in terms of what I see. And so I try my best to kind of keep myself calm and, and continue on because I'm just driving, right? And I, I've been talking as of late that I now realize that I have paid attention to the different sounds of an ambulance, a fire truck, and a police car. And I position myself in my head to relax even more when I hear certain sounds. But when I hear that police car, I freeze up. And I'm not doing anything wrong. And so that just goes to show you that this is a long-term effect. That's why we need support in mental health, wellness, and all those other things, because these things continuously kind of attack our brain, attack our side, and it can really have a lot of, of, of damage to our, our mental and our physical health. And so for me, that has been a, a real challenge. And I've been talking with a lot of my brothers, and they all are feeling the same way, right? Because we thought that it was okay for us to stand up for ourselves and, and to be the person that we say we, could, we should be and that we are. And yet these uh, individuals who are in law enforcement sometimes come along and act as if we are uh, less than and, and, or we don't even belong. Um, and they treat us with such disrespect and they don't care. And so we have to change the narrative even there. So I didn't even think that not only helping ourselves, but even going into law enforcement agencies and helping them understand what they're doing and how they're traumatizing people and what we need to do to change that in, in the future. You know, the question is how has COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the recent instances of police brutality affected black people? Um, and their need for mental health services. Last year in March, when the pandemic started, I was a full-time faculty member and a part-time clinician in private practice. When the pandemic happened, we had a number of people being laid off, losing their job, having to uh, physical distance and isolate themselves. These are all new. People are free, that we have this freedom to come and go. Um, families having to adjust their households with the Wi-Fi and the school and working from home. And this just caused quite a bit, bit of tension and stress and anxiety. Um, you know, uh, Dr. West Alatunju, you talked about a fire drill. We didn't, have, we didn't have pandemic drills to prepare for a pandemic. So this was just sudden and it was traumatic for people. And 
starting in March, April, and May, I started getting a number of people who look like me wanting counseling and seeking out mental health services because they just didn't know how to manage this transition into this pandemic. Simultaneously, now we're dealing with Breonna Taylor, we're de dealing with George Floyd, and the difference is now we've always had police brutality, but with everyone being home, on TV, social media, 24-7, people are watching this, and we know that there's a real thing called race-based traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress syndrome. And then now this is impacting levels of uh, depression and anxiety. And these are normal reactions to these extraordinary events. I shifted last summer from being a full-time faculty member to being a full-time clinician because I had many people who were open to seeking out mental health services, but they really wanted somebody that looked like them or at least was multiculturally competent and can provide the counseling and the mental health services from a culturally appropriate perspective. So I really feel like we, we have had mental health issues, we challenges, we've had mental illness before the pandemic, before George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ar Armad Arbery. However, it was just intensified during this pandemic, which then increased the number of people who have been dealing with this anxiety and this trauma and the level of depression. Yeah, I have a similar story to Dr. Tinsley. So uh, as it seems like the world knows, uh, I, I walked away from a full professorship on December 15th at 12 p.m. Central Time. And the reason why I walked away is similar. I found myself during the pandemic while trying to you know, raise my own child at home and remote teach and having a son you know, who's away at college, returned back home during the pandemic. I was being required by the institution to basically triage these young white girls, I mean, for the lack of a better term. And uh, I was being asked to basically put my own family and my own community on the back burner. Now, keeping in mind that this was started before COVID-19. Uh, as a child of the 90s, you know, I survived the war on poverty. I survived the war on drugs or what some of us like to call the war against Black bodies and the Black family. And then uh, as a tenure track professor going up for tenure, I actually had to survive the Trayvon Martin verdict. I had to survive Jordan Davis, uh, Philando Castile, and then to wake up to COVID-19. And I remember how faculty and students on campus were treating not only me as a black woman professor, but also other black students. And so I woke up and I decided that it was negligent for me to triage someone else's children before giving attention to those of us who have been most harmed in the last 400 to 500 years with less resources on or off campus. And so that, like Dr. Dr. Tinsley, I had to decide. And if we remember anything about the civil rights movement, it actually called for black attorneys, black nurses, black teachers, and black social workers. If we remember because our ancestors and elders understood, they foresaw this moment where we were gonna have a crisis in policing, education, as well as healthcare, in particular, the psychological warfare that we're undergoing right now. So the only thing that COVID-19 did was, as we say over at the African-American Policy Forum, <laughs> is it shined a light. It shined a light, it shone, shined, I don't, it's my Chicago tongue, forgive me. It shined a light on Black oppression and what it's like to be the face at the bottom of the well. And so, yes, I went from full, a full professorship to now full-time uh, clinical practitioner. Yeah. Um... Absolutely. So I've been putting some posting some things in the chat that relate to what it what it is that you all are talking about. And so it's this idea that there's this additive effect. So we were already dealing with all of that before COVID, you know, and then COVID hit uh, and it intensified. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening at the same time. So we're experiencing this as human beings and it's amping up. It is shining that light 
on whatever is good, whatever is bad. It's just shining a light on what's going on. And it's just, it's just knocking everything up a notch, you know? But the question is, you know, how do we survive this? You know, what do we need to do? So I, I know Dr. West has her questions to keep a, keep this momentum going with what it is that we're talking about. But peop, uh, the, the, the participants are already starting to ask questions about what do we do about it? We will be answering some of those questions uh, in the chat, in the questions answers to chat, but also some of those questions will be answered live uh, during our Q&A section. That's just for the participants. Dr. West. Okay. So we sort of talked about the historical trauma and what has been longstanding uh, issues, whether it's about police brutality or about um, differences in access to services, whether they be for physical health or mental health services. But as we think about where we are right now in the midst of everything and how we've been affected, our African-American community has been affected over the past year, what do you all see as being the most pressing mental health needs? of Black children and adolescents in particular? Anyone can just jump right in. Go. I'll try to, oh, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I am the father of an eight-year-old daughter and uh, I'm trying to protect her. I'm trying to keep her shielded. Like I believe my parents tried to shield me as I was growing up. Um, the thing is, I can't, the world is surrounding us and, you know, we tried to take her out of school for a time so that she could, um, be at home and be schooled from home. But we found that to be a problem because she was missing her friends and she was missing outdoors and all those things. And so we couldn't keep, we couldn't consciously keep her at home. We had to send her back. Then it was the, the, the stress of sending her back and what were we sending her to and what was she going to be bringing home and all these other things that were going on and she knew all this as much as we tried to protect her she knew all of this and it really hit home when she drew she made a drawing and it was a black lives matter drawing and she had a heart that was full of rainbows and and over it she had white people and then she had another heart that was broken and had like a little crescent, whatever it is, showing that it was broken. And over that, she had black people. And I asked her, what is this about? Tell me a little bit about what this is going on. And so here I am thinking we're shielding her. And she's like, well, all the stuff that's going on in the world and black and brown lives are being lost, right? She had made in this drawing BLM, the B was black, the L was red, and the M was brown. I asked her about that and she said, well, the black is for the black people, the brown is for the brown, the M is for the brown people. And she said, the L is for the blood. And it stopped me in my tracks mm -hmm. because they are seeing it. So how do we protect them? So we have her, she's going to counseling to see someone, they're doing play therapy with her, but it's important. It's important for her to be able to release and let these things out so that it doesn't sit with her because that anxiety in a child, not knowing what's going on. I, I watched my daughter and you know, the thing that's really crazy about school systems now that they're doing these trainings where they have to run and hide for active shooters. It's traumatizing kids. And I see her and, and you know, something happened. It was rainy one day and she went, she sat in our closet eight years old. So we have to stay on top of our, our, our children and their mental wellness because the world is not gonna wait for them and, 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 and they're gonna to continue to show them, especially black and brown children, that they're less than. And so we have to make them feel, I tell her every day I love her. Every day I let her know that she has someone that she can come to and talk to because it's that important. I think Dr. Evans Winters, you were about to say something. Did you want to add to what Dr. Butler just said? Yes. Uh, hope, hopefully, the noise outside is not, you all can't hear it. Someone's cutting down a tree, like right outside the house. Um, 
I was just going to say that I think, you know, we, we have to help our communities understand uh, how trauma works and how it doesn't work, like how it presents. So currently my youngest client is 13 and some of that is due to the pandemic and my oldest client is 73. And how people who have experienced you know, complex traumas or multiple traumas of what I said recently in social media, right after the, you know, the Siobhan verdict, then we had Micaiah Bryant being killed. So it's like we keep getting hit back to back before we can recover. And, and that's the part sometimes I think mainstream media or even um, people, uh, white people don't understand, even white clinicians or white educators, they don't understand. We're not just talking about one victim, we're talking about we can't recover. So what COVID-19 did to us, it's new to everybody, right? That for us wasn't necessarily a direct trauma because we've survived HIV and AIDS, we've survived mass incarceration, we've survived Jim Crow lynching, right? But what happened was, for the first time, COVID-19 and, and physical distancing forced us to sit in our bodies, whether we wanted to or not. We saw some of the young people, we saw some of the people who were most off the chain say, forget you, I ain't sitting nowhere. I'm going out, I'm a party, I'm a kick it, I'm gonna do this. We saw that. So for, for us, from a clinical perspective, we can say, ooh, <laughs> that's somebody who's uncomfortable in their body. But we also start getting calls and messages and emails from people who decided, yes, I will physical distance, but now I'm shaking. Now I'm having nightmares. Now I'm easily frustrated. Now I'm easy to, easy to anger. And that's the people who we need to figure out how to reach to and say, sis, this is not normal. What does this look like? It might look like, you know, belittling your children. It might look like being aggressive and violent towards your, your partner. It might look like overeating, right? And so what I had to figure out, interestingly enough, one was a call to action, a Colbin. I did have to go out and triage my own people. But also I saw Dr. Cerisi on uh, IG. And this is when I knew that I was going to make the right decision. By the way, I did call her before I jumped. And I, she was passing, I think you were passing out mask. And I said, that's someone who is moving intentionally in her body during a health and racial crises. So we have to teach our people too how to be in the body in meaningful ways. And that's the education part. That's the education part. And that's the part we have to even teach mainstream media as well as educators to Dr. Kent's point. Um, and so, so that's what we're seeing different. So that's the difference you all, how do we respond when we're forced to sit in our traumatized bodies for more than 400 years of trauma that's gonna settle in us. I just wanna add, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to add to what Dr. Butler and Dr. Evans Winters uh, talked about. You know, Dr. Butler, from his own personal experience with his daughter, the trauma, um, what we're experiencing in our practice. One of the things we have to understand we as a Black people are relational people, right? And so when we talk about our Black children, we're trying to teach them to be relational. And right now, because of the pandemic and having to have school from home, that's impacted normal development. So when we talk about developing a sense of purpose, developing social relationships, identity development, those are all being impacted. Um, there were some studies that were conducted here in Pennsylvania because everyone seemed to think that children and adolescents were most concerned about the pandemic. No, they were most concerned with not being with their friend, not engaging in social relationships, not in being involved in their extracurricular, whether it's sports or music. Um, and so this was all impacting. So now we already talk about children and adolescents staying in their room, they're isolating even more and it's increasing this level of depression. And yes, they're concerned about the pandemic and the health piece, but they're also thinking about, hey, what am I supposed to be doing right now when normally I would be in school with my friends engaging and interacting? So then now we have to add a loss. 
all of our children and adolescents are dealing with the loss and they're grieving. And do we ever talk about grief and loss with children and adolescents? We have to help them to understand they're going to go through the stages of grief and loss, which if I take the Kubler-Ross model, they're gonna be kind of just kind of denial, not denying it. Keep asking their caretakers, can I go over somebody's house? I wanna go hang out with this person because I just wanna be with my friends that the depression, the anger, and that anger is being lashed out on people close to them. Um, they might not want to turn their video on when they're in uh, school and uh, virtual learning. So that's impacting their academics. So we have to understand that normal development is being impacted for, with our Black children. Our Black children and adolescents are relational and it's being impacting the relational development, the social development, and it's really impacting this idea of grief and loss, which then can add to what we've just heard is that trauma. So as our world opens back up, as school opens back up, we need to make sure that we are addressing the trauma, the grief, reintroducing people and how to engage in social relationships. Yeah, I want to just jump in because one of the things that I was saying in the chat is for us to remember about resilience. So, you know, we are talking about how we're traumatized, but we have to remember that Black people, more than any people that I have read about, have demonstrated so much resilience in the face of adversity. And so we have to see ourselves in this strength based perspective, see ourselves as resilient people. So, one of the things that's important uh, that Dr. Tensley talked about is this idea of identity. Identity. We've got over 30 years of research talking about the relationship between our African identity and our resilience, our ability to self-actualize, our, our ability to be academically excellent. I mean, all of these things. So we already know that. We know that we need to teach about African identity to our children. Now, why parents don't go toward that, that's a whole nother webinar. But we do know that that's, the per that's what we need to do. It gives us purpose. It gives us direction. It orients us. It gives us a way to look at the world. It gives us a way to, to understand what's happening. It gives us meaning, right? So I think about um, the story of Harriet Jacobs. Harriet Jacobs was a girl who was born during the enslavement. And she lived in the space of the walls of a house, right, of a safe house right, for years, right? How could somebody do that? So we have to ask ourselves, who are we? Who are these people, right? We have to see ourselves as that. If we look at mainstream, mainstream is gonna tell us we can't do anything. We don't have the ability. We don't have the resources. We don't have the agency. We don't have this and we don't have that. And we need this and we need that. But in fact, when you take a look at who we really are, we've done a lot with very little that other people could learn from. So when I think about young people and I think about, oh, okay, they have to do online TV. I'm not minimizing. I am not minimizing the stress that they have endured you know, this year and a half nearly. I am not minimizing that. But I am saying is that when we have meaning and a mission and a purpose, it allows us to endure a lot of stuff toward um, something happening, toward some change, toward something that's better. And that that's what we need to educate. When Dr. Evans Winters talks about teaching and educating and improving our literacy around trauma, the first and very first thing is you have to be in your right mind. There's a Nigerian concept, Yoruba, it's ore iri. It means realigning African heads. And that's what we're talking about here today, about us being in our right minds that allows us to counter race-based trauma. I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. West. And I'm glad you brought that up, Dr. Cerisi, if I can, because uh, I remember it was Dr. Joyce King who brought it to my attention and, and maybe yours as well, that there was some t-shirts going around saying, I'm not my ancestor, I will F you up. And, you know, some of us were shocked because we know that what our ancestors did, everything from poisoning food, if they had to, to burning certain crops to, you know, whatever, even praying for someone, if that's what you had to do. 
And recently I was shocked because there's a movement to throw out this idea of resilience. And as you know, I have a body of research on resiliency in particular, you know, resiliency in African American girls and women. And so to hear people say, no, we don't need resilience. We need to focus on the systems. I thought, whoa, this is again, it shows this disconnect between historical knowledge and present day circumstances. No, we want resilience and we want to transform or dismantle systems. And so this is where those of us who are in the psychological field or even social work, we have to reclaim these terms. As the Bible saying goes, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are white people in power who they will take some of our ideas and they will use them against us or they will pathologize it and say that we're broken or deficient. So yes, we want resilience and we want decolonization. Yes, this Beautiful, one. absolutely beautiful. And uh, I think the thing is so many times that we're so busy trying to help others, like you were saying, Dr. Evans Winters, uh, we, I, I, I know a number of times I've had white colleagues come up to me and say, what can I do? What can I say? And my response to them is, what do you want to do? And what do you want to say? And any other thing going on in your world, you know what to do. All of a sudden a black man loses his life and you don't know what to do. And so we have to break down that barrier. We can't keep protecting them and helping them and, and being nice, so to speak, um, to kind of tiptoe around the actual issues that are really going on, right? White supremacy is here, it's real, it is happening, and they are capitalizing on it on a day-to-day -day basis. And we are then asked to kind of come along and clean up and, and help our people out. And what we really need to be doing is, is, like you said, decolonize and help them recognize what they're doing, how they're providing trauma into the lives of these individuals that they so-called say that they want to help and, and they don't want to do this for. I'm not a racist, I'm not this, I'm not that but they continue to do the same actions over and over and over again. All right, well, let's do a little bit of a segue here. Um, we talked about this whole idea of being able to tap into the historical resiliency of African-Americans in the African-American community and being able to use counseling or therapy as a way to help our clients, our people to tap into their power and, and tap into their um, sense of who they are, give them a sense of direction, help them to work through so many of the traumatic events that we've experienced as a people. So therapy, we know is helpful. We know there's a need, especially now with such as so many increases in depression, anxiety, sleep disorders, et cetera. What do we mean by stigma? What are some of the, what's the stigma associated with mental health? What is it that about uh, mental health services can be stigmatizing for people in general, but especially for African Americans and African American youth. Um, stigma is just this negative attitudes, these beliefs, thoughts, behaviors um, that influence an individual or general public as it relates to uh, their fear, their rejection, their avoidance. Um, the prejudices, um, discrimination of mental health, mental illness of clinicians. With Black people, there's been a history of overdiagnosis <laughs> or underdiagnosis, um, uh, pharmacology and prescription. So this, this fear is if I go to a counselor, you're going to, or a therapist, you're going to prescribe or you're going to um, recommend inpatient or inpatient um, hospitalization. And so we have to really understand that there is just this fear from a public perspective, a self stigma. Um, there is this kind of double stigma as a black person and any other cultural factors, intersectionalities of gender, socioeconomic status, religion. Um, so a stigma could be that I, I can't, I don't need to go to a counselor. I just need to pray about it if I'm a, if I have faith and that God will take care of everything. And so we need to help people to understand 
that we, we have to reduce these stigmas. And so we just have to reduce these attitudes and these negative biases as it relates to mental health, mental illness. That's why I love that we're coming from a mental health perspective because we all have mental health, okay? And so we all can focus on a mental health and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a mental illness. And so we have to help people to understand that. You know, a term I, I like is brain, brain health. We will go to the doctor if we have to uh, some type of physical ailment, but we don't think about our brain and our mind in that regards. So God helps those who helps himself, right? That's the saying that we've heard. And I think that that has been sometimes the downfall in the black communities because most people are like, well, pray it away. Go to God, go to your pastor, go to those individuals who weren't trained in turn of helping people work through some of the issues that they're going through. And so people thought that if I turn my back on God and I don't, and I go to a, a, a counselor or someone out there, then I'm not being true. I'm not, you know, and so they don't want to disappoint God, right? And then they don't want to disappoint their family. And then they have family members who are saying, you know, keep that person in the back closet there. You know, we don't want them out in the open because they crazy or they're this and they're that. And they confuse schizophrenia and all these other things with the fact that that is what you're going to a counselor for. No, you're going to a counselor so that you can talk about some things and work through some things and make some things happen in your life. Just to bounce things off of or do something along those lines. And that's the thing that we don't do very well in communicating what it is that happens in a counseling relationship. And so you have these people who are in, in you know, realizing that if they do this, then they're going to be talking. So that's one of the things in the black community that we don't want. We don't want people talking about us behind our back or this or that. And so all those things tap into, maybe it's not necessarily a stigma. Maybe it's a fact that we, in our strength and who we think we are, we think that we don't need that. And so and, and to avoid it, then we, we compromise ourselves. And then we don't necessarily find a way back right? Because then it gets too lost or it's too far gone. And then we start having a lot more issues than we need. Yeah, I agree. Some of this is about privacy. And so what a lot of people don't know is that there's not a lot of highly qualified clinicians. That's part, that's part of the problem, you know, our, our pipeline. And, and some of this too, these stigmas and this fear of therapy, it does go back to, again, the transatlantic slave trade and uh, the psychiatrists were experimenting on us in our minds and our brains literally with drills. And we remember, even if you try a slave tried to escape an enslaved person, then they were diagnosed with something. Uh, and from my standpoint where I sit now, uh, it becomes complicated depending on the population that you serve. So for example, there is a strong relationship with the criminal and justice system or the judicial system and the work that we do. Uh, I do serve a pool of clients who they're court mandated for therapy. And so they do see it as a form of punishment or people in the community, if they knew they were going for whatever reason, whether it was domestic violence, child neglect, et cetera, then now they have the stigma and they see it as they're, they're being punished, <laughs> right? Their business out there in the streets. Uh, second, our educational system has used these diagnoses and these uh, symptoms against our children. And so somehow it's become connected even with the special education system. So this person has, you know, this disability and they have these set of symptoms. And so now we see it as a handicap, as a handicap. And, we, and also I'm a part of a, a generational cohort where information has definitely been provided to us. It's almost like therapy is this new sexy thing. <laughs> but the problem is, and I dare any one of you all to go on Instagram right now and everyone is an expert on mental health. So our people have a hard time distinguishing not only the professions, like what is the difference between a clinical social worker, a clinical psychologist, a psych D, a psychiatrist, a life coach, a mental health advocate, right? And those lines are being intentionally uh, blurred for profitable reasons. 
right? And then we do have the religious history where, you know, many of us come from families and communities where if something is ailing you mentally, go pray about it or those, those demons, right? And then it gets further complicated for those of us who practice from a spiritual perspective or an African-centered perspective and or pan-African perspective, because many of our religious, religious traditions here in the States, just like the educational system, they separate spirituality or they conflate religion with mental illness or dis-ease. And it becomes complicated for us because we do want to fuse in spirituality and that's the one way our people are actually going to participate, as well as indigenous people and people of, you know, uh, uh, from the global south. Uh, so that's a part of the challenge is that we we do have this. We need education. What is high quality mental health education? What's the difference between a life coach and a licensed clinician? Exactly. Yeah, I'm glad you brought in the point about how the school system and how the the court system or the criminal justice system does sort of use counseling as maybe seen as punishment. Um, and it's really interesting. I, I've worked for eight and a half years as, as the head of a mental health clinic in the juvenile court. And one of the things that we would do when families were bringing in children to, or children were referred from the family or from the school system, we would often, you know, we require that they sit through at least one session with a mental health professional. And some families were okay with that. And others were like, no, that's not what I want. I want him detained, like immediately. I want you to go ahead and have him detained. And sometimes a hard sell that actually, you know, this either there was a recent death and the child is having a difficulty with that. The child maybe has been traumatized in the community or where sometimes at home. And say that before we will seek a court intervention, you'll need to sit through, you know, a series of mental health sessions, counseling sessions. And there was often a lot of pushback, but oftentimes once they actually saw an account, a counselor and saw the benefits of having a counselor, I've also been told sometimes people will say, I don't want to see a psychologist, but I'll talk to you. And I'll say, well, actually I'm a psychologist. And they're like, well, I won't hold that against you. I'll come back and talk to you. Um, so sometimes just for you know clients to see who are we talking about? Who would you need to see? What is your view of what this counselor or psychologist or a psychiatrist is and then actually presenting this person and saying, okay, this is the person you see. Oftentimes, you know, um, attendance rates were much higher once they actually saw who they're going to see. Um, the other piece is I remember a lot of times families would say, oh, my child's not crazy. He's just bad. So go ahead and lock him up. And they'd be like, no, actually, he's not crazy either. He'd be be doing therapy any more than you have to be overweight out of shape to see personal trainer okay um professional athletes have trainers they just want to perfect what they have they want to make it even better they want to enhance their uh you know physical abilities in the same same way you can use counseling and therapy to perfect what you have to be even better to prevent a problem to maintain in your right mind but there are also some times when we can get sort of, you know, out of alignment and we need to get back in alignment. And uh, so sort of presenting in a different way that it doesn't mean you're weak, you know, no matter how strong you are, there are things that can happen in life that can knock you down. It doesn't mean you're weak. It just may mean that what happened to you was so strong and so powerful. But even a strong person can sometimes have difficulty. And so helping people to say, number one, you know, the person you think you'll be saying may not be the person you think. And also that it doesn't mean there's a deficit in you. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It just may mean that you want to, you know, become better at what you do or, or cope better. And so helping people to see it differently and, it's, and that it's not a failure of your faith. It doesn't mean your prayers weren't strong enough. You don't have a strong enough connection with God. It just means that maybe you need to combine that. Any more than you need gas in your car, you can't just pray to have gas. You have to actually maybe pray you have money, but also you need to get to the gas station. So it's this whole thing of prayer plus action is powerful. And that maybe sometimes that action needs to be uh, seeking a counselor or therapist. Could I add something? Uh, and I just kind of want to focus on the spirituality and this religious piece for one second, because mm -hmm. Um, as the director of the Mount Air Counseling Center at Mount Air Baptist Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, back in 2007, our senior pastor, um, Dr. William H. Curtis, was preaching from the pulpit about mental health and mental illness and was talking about how many of the congregants come to the church for counseling and 
he initially was thinking they needed pastoral counseling, biblical counseling, when they in fact needed mental health counseling. That's when he decided he wanted to have right on the campus of the church, a counseling center with trained clinicians, because as Dr. Butler said, there were many pastors who were not trained in the mental health, um, uh, uh, clinical, clinical mental health perspective, psychological perspective. So he really wanted to marry, marry theology and psychology. Just a quick history. If we go back to the New Testament of the Bible, that first century Palestine, we had sitting around a fire, we had the disciples, we had Paul, we had theologians, we had philosophers and psychologists. But then all of a sudden it separated to become defined disciplines. But now in the 20th century coming back together and how do we weave that psychological perspective with somebody's spirituality, with somebody's religion. And I can say as a result of this pandemic, some of the stigmas of um, blending mental health and bridging the gap between faith and mental health have become addressed because many pastors were finding that they needed help. They needed to collaborate with clinicians because of what was going on in the pandemic. And so I do a lot of work with pastors and churches and faith-based organizations to dispel those myths. And we really come from a biblical perspective. Jesus said to the man at the pool, wilt thou be made whole? That is really talking about be made well. And we just talked about wellness and mental health as a part of that wellness. So we could get into the technical piece, but Jesus is saying it's more than just your um, physical transformation. It's your mental transformation. It's your social transformation as well. And so we just got to continue to train and partner uh, with pastors and churches and educating about mental health and really helping to blend theology biblical perspectives and psychology together. Yes, thank you for, for uh, saying that, Dr. Tanya. I, I think that it's important for us to note, too, that keep in mind in the West, in particular in the United States, it's one of the few places where there's this separation of the spiritual, formal education, mental health, and physical health. So that's and even like diet. So that's that's the other problem. We kind of piecemeal this, which is very that's very Eurocentric and, and very Western. Most indigenous cultures, we wouldn't be separating formal education from spirituality, from math, from mental health work, from physical activity too. Good point about it being much more holistic mm -hmm. and the fact that we have gone away from that, but that we're, we're moving more towards incorporating all these various disciplines in the same in the same sphere. Let me add to that conversation uh, about um, one of some of the things that I said to people when I was in private practice and would engage in similar ways that all of you had talked about. So clearly people respond to us. And so it's not about people when we say people don't want to go to counseling. It, you know, it's very much like Dr. West said, it's like, yeah, but I want to go to you. And it's like, that's what we're talking about. So it is, right? As Dr. Bina says, it's just there's a lot of folks out there who are just not competent. And so we need to educate people so they know what to look for. Uh, and they know it when they see it because they stay with you and they're looking for you and they want more people like you. And so when I know, cause I got people tracking me down 20 something years later, I haven't been in practice and they're still like, yeah, but can't you just see me? I'm like, no, no, I'm not seeing anybody. So one of the things I used to talk to people about is mental health tune-ups because a lot of times people think illness and they're not thinking wellness. So it's about why is it that you go and get your teeth checked every six months? Why is it that you go and take your car in to get it checked and get the oil changed and stuff like that? But why is it that you think your soul, you know, your very spirit, your essence, it doesn't need a tune up? Really? It just needs to get encrusted with all the stuff that you deal with, all the things that you're dealing with over time. And you think, I'm good. I'm all right. It's like, no, you need tune ups. You need to go and get some maintenance, right? And get that going. So, so that's how I talked about people got that. They really got that idea that they'll take their car in. They're like, oh, wow, yeah, I don't take myself in. Yeah, you go get your nails done, you get your hair done and you leave the inside just hanging out there. 
No, do the outside and the inside. You know what I'm saying? Get it, get it, get it together. The second is they say, oh, I went to somebody and they were terrible. And I was like, please give me a break. When you go and buy some shoes, I know you don't go to the first store. You don't even go with the first pair of shoes that they bring you. You try on several pairs of shoes. You go to several stores. Why is it that when you go to one person and you don't like them, oh no, I can't go. It's not worth it. It doesn't work. It's not good. It's like, no, take the same care that you would in selecting your shoes, that you would with someone who's dealing with the essence of who you are. So do that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. It's like, so this, this is what I <laughs> tell people. And then lastly, I would say um, what Dr. Venus is saying about the training, I would say uh, it's needed. And that's why we started Crest because we said we need to decolonize. And so that is the purpose of what we're doing. It's like, so if you know that that Eurocentrism in your training is not working. We are saying, you wanna get educated, we are gonna offer you. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I'll talk later when we're about to close to tell you what our next uh, web webinar is gonna be, but we will offer a special training in July where we are gonna focus on African-centered counseling to be able to talk to you about that. We need to de- colonize and put something in its place so that we understand what does it mean when we talk about black mental health is it the same thing is it the same end is is that what we're looking for what kind of person are we saying as someone from an african perspective who we want them to be how they are in the world is that the same thing as what's being offered within a eurocentric context and i say no no, I think we are looking for a different kind of human being that our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents, that's what they were looking for us to become. And that is not this thing that we're studying in school. So we really do need to decolonize. And that is an important piece. Well, can I just add, and I'm gonna say this from a uh, personal perspective as a clinician, I am completely booked right now. And I got people coming and asking to meet with me every single day. I have a waiting list. And as Dr. Evans Winter said, we need to have a pipeline. And having been a faculty, having been involved and being involved in my professional organizations, I do pay attention to those other clinicians who I feel like I can refer to that's going to weave in that multicultural and social justice perspective, that African-centered perspective. And I'm very picky about that. And so we do need to have more training because I can tell you right now, we all know that um, vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, uh, fatigue is real for professional counselors right now. We are in a mental health pandemic and we need to have a pipeline. We need to have more multiculturally competent, social justice competent, African-centered competent counselors because Dr. Evans Winters, myself and all those who are uh, Ashley who are providing counseling we can't do it all and we need to be able to refer to people that we can trust so what are the initiatives that i have going forward especially for black males is to create a pipeline just like you're saying um, not just with clients but with educators and counselors and making the stigma less uh in in the terms of the black male community letting them know that you are needed, you're necessary. There's so much that's happening in the world. Um, there are a lot of people who are now stepping up to the plate and talking about their mental health illness or wellness issues, and that's helping. But that's not, that's, that's not all that's needed. We need to be in our communities. We need to be in legislative offices. We need to be doing things and providing free services to individuals who are needing the support, especially in, in black and brown communities that are not necessarily um, in a place where they can kind of pay out someone for their services in regards to that. So we have to change up our mindset in terms of how we are providing these services to individuals. But the, the, the task force that I'm putting together is about helping us understand how do we create the pipeline? How do we encourage people to come in? And how do we keep them here? 
because most times people get here because of the salary base and everything else and say, you know, I got to turn it around. I can't do this. I can't be successful like Evans Winters and Tinsley who have these practices who are being able to survive and thrive on those types of things. Um, they're, they're, they're kind of taken aback because they're like, well, I'm not making the kind of money I need to make in order to support my family. So we have to be really mindful of that too and helping people understand their financial um, ability as well when they get into this profession. Yes, thank you, Dr. Tanya and Kent. So I, I think too, that's another one of those things about, you know, access and knowledge. People don't even understand too that it's usually just one of us. If we're lucky to run, you know, a large practice, maybe two or three highly qualified clinicians or practitioners. And also people, the public doesn't understand that most of us can only practice in our state. And again, if you have time and resources, you probably get licensed in an, an additional state or two. But again, we have to worry about what Dr. Tanya is speaking on, which is we're still black in America. <laughs> so we experience burnout and compassionate fatigue and all this other stuff. And so, you know, you can get a flood of people. This is the one place where it's very, very, very difficult to um, really either private, like make it, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Profitability to have profitability drive you. So even sometimes when I'm looking on social media, right, I'm kind of laughing because I'm like, if this clinician is partying all day on IG and trying to sell you psychology or social work services, I can tell you now, unless she has 25 people, 25 clinicians, <laughs> she's not as successful as she's pretending to be because this is a health and wellness business. We're the one group of people that we actually have to walk the walk, right? And we can only serve so many people. So if your clinician indicates somehow that, oh my, your calendar, my calendar is really, really booked. I'll see you in six weeks. That's probably not the clinician for you. They may not be in it for the right reasons. I like to use the analogy when I'm in Haiti, Ghana, wherever I'm at, and, and especially in the villages outside of the city, I can tell you now, I do make an appointment with the spiritual <laughs> doctor or the healer, but you can best believe they're pacing themselves. They're probably saying two or three people because we're studying your case. It's not an IG 15 minute cycle. It's not a Facebook post. We're trying to figure out who are you in this larger social cultural context. We're studying your family history. And some of us who believe in it, we're praying on it and med meditating on your case. We're dreaming in some cases. Do we know when to cut it off? Yes, but we're also giving you our full attention. And thank you for sharing that because there are people who are branding geniuses, right? They are out there doing it and, and, and looking at them. What, ha what have you done? What are you actually bringing to the table? You got all this stuff that you've been doing, but you have not really showcased what your work has really been. So thank you for sharing that, Dr. Evans. -Wynn. Yes, it, and thank you, Dr. Kitt, because again, I was paying attention to you all's bios and I know my sister, Dr. Cerisi, she was too. So I can tell you now, if you made it this far, her and Dr. Constance West, they've already done their research. And that's why they also mentioned that I have the Write Like a Scholar program. All of our work, no matter how esoteric we might present, is based off empirical research-based data. So even as I tell the couples, if I'm doing couples yoga, you know, with you, more than likely, I don't just like to see the male partner in his tight pants trying to do yoga, but it's more than likely supported by research and backed up by research I've conducted myself or in partnership with others. Yes. Bring us another question, Dr. Constance West. Okay. Well, actually... I think it's time for us to turn this over to Ashley because uh, we're going to go with the questions from the participants. They've been sort of chomping at the bit. I can see they've been, you know, knocking those questions out. They've been posing questions all along. Some of them we've already addressed to some extent, but I'm going to count on Ashley to review the questions and to go ahead and go get some of the questions posed to our panel. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. West. Um, as Dr. West stated, some of them, I know that Dr. West Olotenji had um, responded to them in the chat, but I wanted to share this question that um, specifically was um, geared towards Dr. Butler. Um, so in the beginning, Dr. Butler, you were talking about your experiences um, with seeing police on the side of the road and, and how you've like responded and kind of coped with that, um, given all that has been going on. Um, and so it, Rhonda Jones has mentioned that we're all in that space um, and they've asked 
to for you to talk about what you would describe um how would you describe that as like a form of trauma and how you think it could be dealt with um within ourselves and at the community level well i i, I gave voice to it almost immediately i knew what was happening um i was intuitive to what was going on with that and so i br i bring it into all my spaces now i don't just um rely on um going to seek because I knew that it was happening too often. I, I mean, every time, even today, I was driving and I saw a police officer with someone pulled over and, and I have this feeling. And so I needed to bring um, voice to it. So I have a, uh, me and my brothers, we meet once a month. We talk about those things. Um, we also, I, I just share with you that um, I have to pay attention to what happened to me on January 6th as well, because I was, I was worried on January 6th. I was in my home, but still concerned because I live in an area where I see people with flags and red Trump hats and all these other things that were going on. And so, um, so the concern is um, internal, but then I need to bring voice to it. I need to let people know that this is happening to me and, and, and also sitting in spaces and talking about it um, with a counselor or, or whomever. So I think it's really important to stay in tune with everything that's going on for you. And it just, even if it seems slight, doesn't mean that it doesn't mean something, right? So many times that we, you know, we get something and it's like a, a blister or whatever, oh, that will go away, right? No, these things are insidious, right? They, they start to build and build and build on top of other things. And so I'm trying to decrease that as much as possible in my life. And so seeking out counseling is the most important way to be able to do that. Thank you for that, Dr. Butler. Um, I know that that was um, mostly consistent with what Dr. Wesson Tunji had shared in her written response, just about like how important healthy relationships are. And it sounds like through you kind of talk through that different spaces that you occupy and acknowledging that you're, those therapy you know that you're not isolated. You know that you're not exactly. isolated. You know, mm -hmm. uh, when I sit and talk with my brothers about what's happening for them, before I was holding it in, I was like, okay, this is just me. I don't know what's going on. I, you know, I'll just get over it. But when I started seeing that my other brothers were having the same issues, that we can talk about it, that we can cry about it, that we can do all other things about it, because those are the things that we've been all conditioned to believe, right? You can't, you, you, to be a strong, resilient black man, you can't show this, 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 and that. And I'm like, no, to be a strong black man, you need to show all this and you need to go take care of it. And that's how you're going to go up on the other side of that and, and be stronger about it. Absolutely. I hear you um, talking about like normalizing these types of conversations um, in, in all of our healthy relationships and other relationships and, and the spaces that we occupy. Um, so the next question is one that I was really um, glad that was asked via the Q&A um, feature because it is about uh, students. Um, and so Samaya in the chat is I'm asking a question to any of our panelists, so any of you, any of you can answer. Um, just any advice that you have for a new graduate student, I'm um, Samaya specifically MSW, but if you'd like to speak to counseling, psychology students, um, whomever. Um, but for those of us that do have a passion um, for mental health and working with Black youth, um, what does it look like for us to kind of step off of the Eurocentric train tracks that might be our recent education and wanting to step into more African-centered, more culturally competent, um, those sorts of care? got to feed your mind. Uh, I'm going to put into the chat my book that's coming out. It's an intro to counseling book that I think is going to be really important for folks to kind of take in. It's really multicultural and social justice minded in regards to that. We have Dr. Sarisi in there, other folks in there who are talking about the real stuff that needs to be happening in our counseling relationships. And so uh, I'll put that into the chat, but we have to read up. We, need, we just can't rely on social media and other things to get us by. We need to know our stuff, right? We've, we've uh, had the history and we know all the stuff that's going on through time, but we need to really sit down and understand it better. And we need to maybe sit with scholars and talk about these things so that we can get even more elevated in our knowledge base. But we just can't sit and watch it all on social media. That's not gonna get it. That's not gonna help us move forward.
There's a new, another new book out, uh, Dr. Annalise Singh. Uh, she worked with Dr. Butler in uh, revising the multicultural and social justice uh, counseling competencies. It's the Racial Healing Handbook, Practical Activities to Help You Challenge Privilege, Confront Systemic ra Racism, and Engage in Collective Healing. So I would definitely recommend that book for your own personal development, but also to weave into your counseling work as well. Yeah, and there's another book, unfortunately, I couldn't find it to put in the chat, but it is uh, titled African-Centered Perspectives on Social Work. And so it does provide a, a, a list of readings, but also it's a very paradigmatic book. So your paradigms for uh, studying. And also I would say, you know, don't be afraid to say study traditional European uh, men, because when you dig deep into a lot of their scholarship, they will actually admit that they found a lot of their practices and knowledge from African scholars or from African practitioners, indigenous practitioners. Even when you listen to Carl Jung, for example, he will cite, you know, his work amongst the Africans, right, or other indigenous cultures. Um, uh, and, and I would say too, like go outside. I think for us, you kind of always have to flip American culture on its head. So don't be afraid to study outside of the US. Uh, for me studying in, in South Africa and studying in West Africa, Ghana, even though they may not have those formal terms of say social workers, psychologists or counselor, we know, especially in places like South Africa, they were grandfather clause into this thing called social work. So, you know, go study and see how they help in high density HIV AIDS communities. That's where I actually served at when I was a younger scholar. Uh, go see, you know, go work uh, with the women, the, mar the women in marketing in, in say West Africa or Ghana or uh, foster care kids who are in, they call them, oh, they call them orphans in South Africa or kids in care, foster care or waiting to be adopted. Uh, go serve and in, in, intern in schools in Africa on the continent. And that's where you will really learn a lot of these indigenous practices that are really passed down through oral history. Uh, and of course here, I would say, uh, I know it's hard and I was having this conversation because I'm getting a lot of calls y'all by the way from interns. We, we have a lot of uh, publicity right now around mental health care. And so I'm getting a lot of calls from undergrads and masters level students looking for internships. I know it's hard for black people because we're missing out on possible income, but don't think of it as an internship. Think of it as a, an apprenticeship where you're developing skills by watching someone else's rhythms, how they carry themselves, what's on their bookshelves. So not just the day-to-day -day business of this work. And also go back to who your, your mothers and your grandmothers were as spiritual and religious people, because some of that is being passed down, even though it may be camouflaged as something more normal or religious, but it's actually the old ways of helping to heal us and sustain us towards resilience. Thank you all so much for that. Um, those are um, really good pointers for us students who are looking to expand our multicultural social justice repertoire as we enter the field. Um, so that, that's really helpful and I see that um, it's been helpful for Samaya in the chat as well. Um, so we have a few more minutes for some questions and I wanted to um, pose these to all of the panelists. Um, I know that we've talked a lot about stigma in this conversation, and we know that I think we've been talking about it from a very external sense, like, you know, stigma that is imposed, you know, from outside sources onto the individual. Um, but we know a lot of those external um, stigma can be internalized, right? And we begin to, we might begin to impose some of those things onto ourselves. So when I think about um, some of the common myths that Black people um, associate with mental health services, um, I'd like for each of the panelists to share like what you think is the like one of the main myths that we might hear in our communities um, about receiving mental health services. And then I'd like for you to also dispel that myth for us. Um, so what are some of the common myths plaguing our communities? And if you can correct that for our the audience here today. And this can be related to um, faith um, or even if we're thinking about lifespan, I know we've talked a lot about kids, older adults in between. Um, whatever's coming to mind for you. 
I, I would say there's so, there's so many different that we've talked about, but um, it's too expensive. I can't afford it. Um, that's that cultural mistrust that the white professionals could not understand the problems of African-American black people, this general um, mistrust. Um, first thing you're gonna do is prescribe medication. Um, I don't want you to judge me because I'm not praying hard enough <laughs> for those that are faith and mental health. Um, access knowing where to go. I can, I can tell you right now, I, I have some clients that need um, good psychiatric evaluations and finding access to a psychiatrist who have openings who take their insurance because um, I work with a number of clients who are on Medicaid and not all psychiatrists take Medicaid. So just this whole idea of access. And so I think it's really important for us as uh, clinicians, those of us who are providing support services, we need to know the resources in our communities, in the states that we are licensed, people that we can consult with and collaborate, having a direct person at the insurance companies that you can talk to and, and collaborate with as well. Um, but I just, you know, those are just some that I, I will put out there. I think, well, uh... Uh, yeah, it's a lot out there, uh, but uh, I'm thinking of the ones I would hear in, in my language, you know, that's white people stuff. I was going to say the other word. <laughs> this might circulate one day on YouTube or something. That's, that's white people stuff. Um, and, 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 and that's, I mean, <laughs> nothing says that therapy belongs to white people, first of all. You know, that's a myth. Um, the other thing is that, you know, you have to be um, uh, rich or, or wealthy. I believe now, I think I just recently, actually, I'm not sure. I did also like sign a contract to be paneled with, to provide services for people with Medicaid. I'm still new to that just because even the medical industry itself and the insurance companies are began to destigmatize what is mental health and who should as, have access to it. And that's the politicization of mental health care, all people, especially black and brown, poor people should have access to it. So check in about that. There are uh, many now growing nonprofits and startups that are investing in affordable or free mental health care. Now, some of us, to be honest, we do work around models where people should pay something into their health care, right? So sometimes I might go to a, a medicine doctor and I will give them some Smirnoff or rum, right? <laughs> I can't take alcohol in my practice, guys, before y'all contact me, but we do have some type of mutual exchange or offering of services. And so for me, I provide a sliding scale fee. I can't see everybody. I am paneled with insurance companies, so I do have to be fair and equitable. And also, I think uh, Dr. Tanya just said something really, really important that I do want to give attention to. It, it's just not enough, y'all. It's not enough highly qualified clinicians of color, Black, Indigenous, or people of uh, who are Latinx, okay? So keep that in mind. But you would not not go to the dentist. You would not not go to your ob gyne because they're not Black, okay? So research does show, although people of color do have a preference for clinicians who look like them and come from similar cultural backgrounds, Research also show that people who are not African-American, who aren't Black or Indigenous can also provide high quality services to people of color. Okay, so that's another thing. Yeah, I just, that's another myth or, I don't know if it's a myth, but it's another educational point. I'm laughing. So I think the, the, the question was for one, but I'm gonna give you a few too. Um, so just really quickly, you have to have a mental illness to go to counseling. That's one that's, that's, that's not true. Um, people assume that there's something wrong with you if you seek counseling, which is not true. Um, men aren't in touch with their feelings, so counseling won't help. That's not true. Um, seeking counseling is a sign of weakness. I said that earlier. That's not true. And lastly, the one I'll stick with is, you know, if you go to counseling, everyone will judge you negatively. You got to get that out of your head. First of all, when you go to counseling, it's a confidential thing. Nobody's going around telling your business, right? It's between you and your therapist, and that is it. And so 
you have to really recognize that when you go to seek someone, you are going in and, and you know, if it's a building or whatever, people are not paying attention to you like that. You know, this is not like people out there like, oh my God, did you just see so-and-so going to that building over there? They live in their own life. So go live your best life. Why are you worried about what somebody else has got to say about you? So you go and do the work that's necessary so that you can get better, you can feel better, you can do the things that you wanna do in your life. Sometimes just going to counseling is just to go to say, look, should I wear this shirt or that shirt? It doesn't matter. Go do what you gotta do with your counselor and stop worrying about what other people are going to say because you know what? They're not paying your bills. They're not doing anything for you. And so if you are that beholden to someone else and what they're thinking about you, then you were already missed them that you need to get on a, on a whole nother trip because that is not where it is, you know? So go seek the help that you need. Stop worrying about other folks. It is confidential and you can be through it without anybody seeing or knowing or even caring that you're going into that building, you know? Just and, and you could stuff. trust and believe too, right, Dr. Kent, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Tanya? Yeah. Trust and believe we do not only see black people or people of yeah. color. There That's are, true. I had to set aside, like, it's crazy, but once you are really good at what you do, everybody is going to come to you. Yeah. To the point and that, you, yeah, they, they will put us on retainer. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're looking for a profession now, and I know, Tanya, you're doing this, um, doing it, telling mental health yes. is going to be the next wave. You got to, you know, so it could be lucrative. And people think that it's not lucrative. But you know, you as a counselor, I mean, that's the other thing that's a myth, right? That you know, this is not a great field for you to go in. But it's really about what you're doing for yourself because the help that you're giving, being altruistic and all those other things that come from counseling, oh, it's so many highs from being a counselor from when you see somebody being successful. And so those are the other things that are myths. So more than money, being able to help other people, if that's who you are, then this is a field for you. And so that is a myth that people think that, you know, oh, I won't make any money. I won't do this. You can make the money. You have to be smart about it. You have to be business minded. You got to take care of yourself and everything else is going on. But you can do this. And as we just said, there's a shortage. So go make that money. Go get your business model. Make go do money. all the things that you need to do. Get your people up under you and you can make a, a very successful operation. And I want to just say, one, now that you both have said that, here's another myth. I have brought on interns with my private practice. So these are master's level interns that are um, completing their requirements for their degree. And I've heard people come back to me and say, well, Dr. T, I don't want to work with an intern. They're not qualified. And I think we have to dispel that myth about our interns because our interns are qualified and when we talk about that stigma out there that it costs too much, just because it's pro bono does not mean that you're getting, you're not getting quality counseling. So let's dispel the myth. If it's pro bono, you're still getting evidence-based high quality counseling and interns can provide evidence-based high quality counseling. Mm -hmm. Under the oh, right supervisor. Supervision. <laughs> Definitely supervision. <laughs> <laughs> I can see we are just getting revved up. My goodness. Thank you all. Wow. Um, for really providing us with truth today about what's going on in terms of our mental health and wellness in our community and what we need to do at whatever stage we're in, in terms of providing these services. Uh, it's been wonderful. Thank you for such an active chat. Um, and questions, but we I see resources flying uh, in the chat room. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Ashley, thank you for facilitating our Q&A. We are coming to the end. We've got two minutes to try to uh, just tell you about uh, what's upcoming. Uh, so Ashley, could you take uh, just a, a short amount of time and tell us about our position announcement? Absolutely sure thing. So I know that we have some students on the call. I wanted to announce um, that the CRESS program is hiring a new graduate assistant for the 2021-2022 academic year. Um, so if you're a doctoral student in a counseling program um, that's interested in gaining more experience in this stuff, um, more culture-centered, trauma-informed care, 
um, the Crest program may be right for you. Um, so I'm the first graduate assistant of Crest, and I can um, talk a little bit about the um, the variety of roles. Um, so you might be involved in conducting searches, developing annotated bibliographies, literature reviews. Um, we also develop a lot of the promotional materials for Crest. So similar to webinars that you. Um, it, like today, um, so developing flyers and, and resources and things like that. Um, the podcasts and the practitioner briefs that Dr. West Olatunji mentioned at the start of the webinar, those are also um, the responsibilities of, of, of the GAs. Um, we also help to manage the chats during events like this, and so that's a whole lot of fun. Um, and then also, if you are not subscribed to our Crest newsletter, um, our social media intern, Janae, I'm actually put that link into the chat, so make sure that you are subscribed to that. Um, and if you are selected as a, a Crest GA, you'll help to um, create and, and disseminate that. So it's a lot of fun. We learn a lot and we do a lot. And if you're interested, um, I will share um, a little bit. I think Dr. West will share the flyer um, at a later date, but it'll kind of detail um, what you need to submit in order to apply. Um, and the deadline is July 1. So we've got some time, um, but we'll be sharing that um, more about that in the next coming weeks. So. Um, to all the students out there who are interested in continuing with this work and gaining additional experience, I highly recommend um, joining the Crest team. Thank you. And Ashley's not leaving. It's just that uh, she's adding, adding. And so the new GA will work uh, with her and, and at her direction. Our next webinar has already been released. It's already published out there. And I see people are already joining and registering for that. Uh, and the title of that is Decolonizing. I think I have a, a picture for you. Let's see. Yes. Move that up. Yeah, so Decolonizing uh, Mental Health Training Using a Culture-Centered Approach to Working with Black Youth. And what we want to tell you is that if you participate in this training, you will get a discount in uh, the training that will come up. We're gonna do um, a series in July where I will provide training on African-centered counseling theory. Uh, and so just like the Culture-Centered Mondays that we did back in November, we'll offer a series, you'll go through all three They'll all be recorded, so if you've paid for the training, you'll be able to access them, uh, whether you're able to um, go through the live or you'll just do it asynchronously uh, if you go ahead and register. So that's coming up. We've got the free webinar June 21 at 7 p.m. Eastern time. This one will be in the evening. Uh, and so that'll be free, but if you attend that, we'll give you a discount code sometime during that webinar, and you can use it to sign up for the training on African-centered counseling theory and interventions. So that is uh, us coming to the end of this webinar. We thank you all so much for being here. Um, I see uh, Samaya is already, oh, excellent, excellent. So you're connected to Dr. Melanie Acosta, and Melanie Acosta has provided us with one of our papers, our commission papers. Uh, and so you can see her video up there. So that's awesome. Thank you all. If you have any other questions, feel free uh, to email us, instant message us, um, follow us on all of our social media, check the website from time to time uh, and look forward to the June newsletter, uh, Uplift, that's coming out next month. Thank you to our panelists who brought Oh my goodness, you brought such wisdom today and energy. Uh, there was a lot of energy today. So thank you so much. Much appreciated. Uh, that's it, I guess. And we'll send you a link to the video that'll be up on our YouTube channel. So expect an email from us shortly. All right, thank you all so much. Bye-bye.